section nine of the three impostors by arthur Mackin. this librivox recording is in the public domain part three of novel of the black seal the old man returned to his work and i strolled on down the path between the espaliers gnarled and gouty with age thinking of the story i had heard and groping for the point in it that had some key to my memory in an instant it came before me i had seen the phrase grey hills on the slip of yellowed paper that professor gregg had taken from the drawer in his cabinet again i was seized with pangs of mingled curiosity and fear i remembered the strange characters copied from the limestone rock and then again their identity with the inscription of the age-old seal and the fantastic fables of the latin geographer i saw beyond doubt that unless coincidence had set all the scene and disposed all these bizarre events with curious art i was to be a spectator of things far removed from the usual and customary traffic and jostle of life professor gregg i noted day by day he was hot on his trail growing lean with eagerness and in the evenings when the sun was swimming on the verge of the mountain he would pace the terrace to and fro with his eyes on the ground while the mist grew white in the valley and the stillness of the evening brought far voices near and the blue smoke rose a straight column from the diamond-shaped chimney of the grey farmhouse just as i had seen it on the first morning i have told you i was of sceptical habit but though i understood little or nothing i began to dread vainly proposing to myself the iterated dogmas of science that all life is material and that in the system of things there is no undiscovered land even beyond the remotest stars where the supernatural can find a footing yet there struck in on this the thought that matter is really as awful and unknown as spirit that science itself but dallies on the threshold scarcely gaining more than a glimpse of the wonders of the inner place there is one day that stands up from amidst the others as a grim red beacon betokening evil to come i was sitting on a bench in the garden watching the boy craddock weeding when i was suddenly alarmed by a harsh and choking sound like the cry of a wild beast in anguish and i was unspeakably shocked to see the unfortunate lad standing in full view before me his whole body quivering and shaking at short intervals as though shocks of electricity were passing through him his teeth grinding foam gathering on his lips and his face all swollen and blackened to a hideous mask of humanity i shrieked with terror and professor gregg came running and as i pointed to craddock the boy with one convulsive shudder fell face forward and lay on the wet earth his body writhing like a wounded blind worm and an inconceivable babble of sounds bursting and rattling and hissing from his lips he seemed to pour forth an infamous jargon with words or what seemed words that might have belonged to a tongue dead since untold ages and buried beneath nilotic mud or in the inmost recesses of the mexican forest for a moment the thought passed through my mind as my ears were still revolted with that infernal clamour surely this is the very speech of hell and then i cried out again and again and ran away shuddering to my inmost soul i had seen professor gregg's face as he stooped over the wretched boy and raised him and i was appalled by the glow of exultation that shone on every lineament and feature as i sat in my room with drawn blinds and my eyes hidden in my hands i heard heavy steps beneath and i was told afterwards that professor gregg had carried craddock to his study and had locked the door i heard voices murmur indistinctly and i trembled to think of what might be passing within a few feet of where i sat i longed to escape to the woods and sunshine and yet i dreaded the sights that might confront me on the way and at last as i held the handle of the door nervously i heard professor gregg's voice calling to me with a cheerful ring it's all right now miss lally he said the poor fellow has got over it 
and i have been arranging for him to sleep here after tomorrow perhaps i may be able to do something for him yes he said later it was a very painful sight and i don't wonder you were alarmed we may hope that good food will build him up a little but i am afraid he will never be really cured and he affected the dismal and conventional air with which one speaks of hopeless illness and yet beneath it i detected the delight that leapt up rampant within him and fought and struggled to find utterance it was as if one glanced down on the even surface of the sea clear and immobile and saw beneath raging depths and a storm of contending billows it was indeed to me a torturing and offensive problem that this man who had so bounteously rescued me from the sharpness of death and showed himself in all the relations of life full of benevolence and pity and kindly forethought should so manifestly be for once on the side of the demons and take a ghastly pleasure in the torments of an afflicted fellow-creature apart i struggled with the horned difficulty and strove to find the solution but without the hint of a clue beset by mystery and contradiction i saw nothing that might help me and began to wonder whether after all i had not escaped from the white mist of the suburb at too dear a rate i hinted something of my thought to the professor i said enough to let him know that i was in the most acute perplexity but the moment after regretted what i had done when i saw his face contort with a spasm of pain my dear miss lally he said you surely do not wish to leave us no no you would not do it you do not know how i rely on you how confidently i go forward assured that you are here to watch over my children you miss lally are my rear guard for let me tell you the business in which i am engaged is not wholly devoid of peril you have not forgotten what i said the first morning here my lips are shut by an old and firm resolve till they can open to utter no ingenious hypothesis or vague surmise but irrefragable fact as certain as a demonstration in mathematics think it over miss lally not for a moment would i endeavor to keep you here against your own instincts and yet i tell you frankly that i am persuaded it is here here amidst the woods that your duty lies i was touched by the eloquence of his tone and by the remembrance that the man after all had been my salvation and i gave him my hand on a promise to serve him loyally and without question a few days later the rector of our church a little church gray and severe and quaint that hovered on the very banks of the river and watched the tides swim and return came to see us and professor gregg easily persuaded him to stay and share our dinner mr merrick was a member of an antique family of squires whose old manor house stood amongst the hills some seven miles away and thus rooted in the soil the rector was a living store of all the old fading customs and lore of the country his manner genial with a deal of retired oddity won on professor gregg and towards the cheese when a curious burgundy had begun its incantations the two men glowed like the wine and talked of philology with the enthusiasm of a burgess over the peerage the parson was expounding the pronunciation of the welsh double l and producing sounds like the gurgle of his native brooks when professor gregg struck in by the way he said that was a very odd word i met with the other day you know my boy poor gervais craddock well he has got the bad habit of talking to himself and the day before yesterday i was walking in the garden here and heard him he was evidently quite unconscious of my presence a lot of what he said i couldn't make out but one word struck me distinctly it was such an odd sound half sibilant half guttural and as quaint as those double l's you have been demonstrating i do not know whether i can give you an idea of the sound ishakshar is perhaps as near as i can get but the k ought to be a greek 
kai or a spanish jota now what does it mean in welsh in welsh said the parson there is no such word in welsh nor any word remotely resembling it i know the book welsh as they call it and the colloquial dialects as well as any man but there's no word like that from anglesey to usk besides none of the craddocks speak a word of welsh it's dying out here really you interest me extremely mr merrick i confess the word didn't strike me as having a welsh ring but i thought it might be some local corruption no i never heard such a word or anything like it indeed he added smiling whimsically if it belongs to any language i should say it must be that of the fairies the tywood teg as we call them the talk went on to the discovery of a roman villa in the neighbourhood and soon after i left the room and sat down apart to wonder at the drawing together of such strange clues of evidence as the professor had spoken of the curious word i had caught the glint in his eye upon me and though the pronunciation he gave was grotesque in the extreme i recognized the name of the stone of sixty characters mentioned by solinus the black seal shut up in some secret drawer of the study stamped forever by a vanished race with signs that no man could read signs that might for all i knew be the veils of awful things done long ago and forgotten before the hills were moulded into form when the next morning i came down i found professor gregg pacing the terrace in his eternal walk look at that bridge he said when he saw me observe the quaint and gothic design the angles between the arches and the silvery grey of the stone in the awe of the morning light i confess it seems to me symbolic it should illustrate a mystical allegory of the passage from one world to another professor gregg i said quietly it is time that i knew something of what has happened and of what is to happen for the moment he put me off but i returned again with the same question in the evening and then professor gregg flamed with excitement don't you understand yet he cried but i have told you a good deal yes and shown you a good deal you have heard pretty nearly all that i have heard and seen what i have seen or at least and his voice chilled as he spoke enough to make a good deal clear as noonday the servants told you i have no doubt that the wretched boy craddock had another seizure the night before last he awoke me with cries in that voice you heard in the garden and i went to him and god forbid you should see what i saw that night but all this is useless my time here is drawing to a close i must be back in town in three weeks as i have a course of lectures to prepare and need all my books about me in a very few days it will be all over and i shall no longer hint and no longer be liable to ridicule as a madman and a quack no i shall speak plainly and i shall be heard with such emotions as perhaps no other man has ever drawn from the breasts of his fellows he paused and seemed to grow radiant with the joy of great and wonderful discovery but all that is for the future the near future certainly but still the future he went on at length there is something to be done yet you will remember my telling you that my researches were not altogether devoid of peril yes there is a certain amount of danger to be faced i did not know how much when i spoke on the subject before and to a certain extent i am still in the dark but it will be strange adventure the last of all the last demonstration in the chain he was walking up and down the room as he spoke and i could hear in his voice the contending tones of exultation and despondence or perhaps i should say awe the awe of a man who goes forth on unknown waters and i thought of his allusions to columbus on the night he had laid his book before me the evening was a little chilly and a fire of logs had been lighted in the study where we were the remittent flame and the glow on the walls reminded me of the old days i was sitting silent in an armchair by the fire wondering over all i had heard 
and still vainly speculating as to the secret springs concealed from me under all the phantasmagoria i had witnessed when i became suddenly aware of a sensation that change of some sort had been at work in the room and that there was something unfamiliar in its aspect for some time i looked about me trying in vain to localize the alteration that i knew had been made the table by the window the chairs the faded settee were all as i had known them suddenly as a sought-for recollection flashes into the mind i knew what was amiss i was facing the professor's desk which stood on the other side of the fire and above the desk was a grimy-looking bust of pit that i had never seen there before and then i remembered the true position of this work of art in the furthest corner by the door was an old cupboard projecting into the room and on top of the cupboard fifteen feet from the floor the bust had been and there no doubt it had delayed accumulating dirt since the early days of the century i was utterly amazed and sat silent still in a confusion of thought there was so far as i knew no such thing as a stepladder in the house for i had asked for one to make some alterations in the curtains of my room and a tall man standing on a chair would have found it impossible to take down the bust it had been placed not on the edge of the cupboard but far back against the wall and professor gregg was if anything under the average height how on earth did you manage to get down pit i said at last the professor looked curiously at me and seemed to hesitate a little they must have found you a stepladder perhaps the gardener brought in a short ladder from outside no i had no ladder of any kind uh, now miss lally he went on with an awkward simulation of jest there is a little puzzle for you a problem in the manner of the inimitable holmes there are the facts plain and patent summon your acuteness to the solution of the puzzle for heaven's sake he cried with a breaking voice say no more about it i tell you i never touch the thing and he went out of the room with horror manifest on his face and his hand shook and jarred the door behind him i looked round the room in vague surprise not at all realizing what had happened making vain and idle surmises by way of explanation and wondering at the stirring of black waters by an idle word and the trivial change of an ornament this is some petty business some whim on which i have jarred i reflected the professor is perhaps scrupulous and superstitious over trifles and my question may have outraged unacknowledged fears as though one killed a spider or spilled the salt before the very eyes of a practical scotchwoman i was immersed in these fond suspicions and began to plume myself a little on my immunity from such empty fears when the truth fell heavily as lead upon my heart and i recognized with cold terror that some awful influence had been at work the bust was simply inaccessible without a ladder no one could have touched it i went out to the kitchen and spoke as quietly as i could to the housemaid who moved that bust from the top of the cupboard anne i said to her professor gregg says he has not touched it did you find an old stepladder in one of the outhouses the girl looked at me blankly i never touched it she said i found it where it is now the other morning when i dusted the room i remember now it was wednesday morning because it was the morning after cradock was taken bad in the night my room is next to his you know miss the girl went on piteously and it was awful to hear how he cried and called out names that i couldn't understand it made me feel all afraid and then master came and i heard him speak and he took down cradock to the study and gave him something and you found that bust moved the next morning yes miss there was a queer sort of smell in the study when i came down and opened the windows a bad smell it was and i wondered what it could be do you know miss i went a long time ago to the zoo in london with my cousin thomas barker one afternoon that i had off when i was at mrs prince's in stanhope gate 
and we went into the snake house to see the snakes and it was just the same sort of smell very sick it made me feel i remember and i got barker to take me out and it was just the same kind of smell in the study as i was saying and i was wondering what it could be from when i see that bust with pit cut in it standing on the master's desk and i thought to myself now who has done that and how have they done it and when i came to dust the things i looked at the bust and i saw a great mark on it where the dust was gone for i don't think it can have been touched with a duster for years and years and it wasn't like finger marks but a large patch like broad and spread out so i passed my hand over it without thinking what i was doing and where that patch was it was all sticky and slimy as if a snail had crawled over it very strange isn't it miss and i wonder who can have done it and how that mess was made end of part three of the novel of the black seal